the fourth lecture of uh, Tanya Sharpi. Please. Thank, thank you. Um, so, hello. as a re hello, is Can connection we recording in progress? Okay. Okay. So today, um, the first week, we talked about information, we talked about entropy, and we talked about um, information in the linear system with the Gaussian uh, um, inputs and Gaussian outputs. And then we started to talk about nonlinearity in neural responses. And today's topic will be maximal informative nonlinearities for multiple neurons and how they are um, coordinated with each other. And uh, so we will continue with this topic today and also talk about how that leads to a theory of diversification in biology. We will compare this with um, properties of neurons in the retina and also talk about how this uh, um, is related to a theory of phase transitions, how one can uh, think of this diversification as a second order phase transition and how this theory can be used to predict large scale properties of retinal arrays. So to uh, sum up of what we started last week, if we have an analog signal and one neuron which has one threshold, then I will not have access to all of the underlying analog signal, but yes. Um, but um, I will only know where, whether the values were below or above the threshold. And uh, so if it was above the threshold, we will denote it as one. And if it is below the threshold for that neuron, it will be zero. But actually, my information will be even somewhat less than that because the, the threshold, effective threshold fluctuates. So even if we were to repeat the signal, then on some trials, um, there will be a spike. And then on the next trial, the neural will um, not produce a spike. So that's a setup for one neuron. And... Uh, Ideally, in order to maximize information, and it's similar to those um, um, games that we discussed with uh, submarines and so on, if I have a range of possibilities, I would like to place the threshold um, ideally in the middle of the distribution such that I will have one bit of information. But maybe that will um, require me to produce spikes more frequently than the system can sustain. And so in that case, I will be as close as possible to this um, a central point, given the metabolic constraints on the neural firing rate. So in the case of one neuron, uh, one binary neuron, the problem of maximally informative um, uh, solution is, um, I mean, it doesn't have anything interesting, uh, is, is fixed by metabolic constraint. But then it becomes um, more interesting once we have two neurons. So this is just uh, how we can quantify for one neuron. We will compute the response entropy, uh, meaning um, the, the variability in this direction and across trials, the overall variability and subtract the variability across trials. So for a given value of time or x. So now when we have two neurons, then uh, what is interesting now, um, of course, I will have uh, more gradation, more information about the underlying analog signal. So I have now two thresholds and uh, 
if um, we know that if uh, the value was very high, then both neurons will spy. And if the value is intermediate, then a blue neuron will produce a spike and the red neuron will not produce a spike. So let's see if we have any cases like this. So for example, here, um, here. So in that case, I know that the signal was somewhere in the intermediate range. So with two neurons, we now have more access to the underlying analog signal. But the question remains, what is the optimal separation between the thresholds of these two neurons? And um, <clears throat> so the parameters of the problem, there are only four parameters. The, the two thresholds, mu one and mu two, and the uncertainty in the um, uh, or reliability of uh, the two neurons, new one and new two. So we will consider that um, the solution will be at different levels, uh, separately um, for different values of noise, because noise is um, uh, also to reduce amount of noise. I also need to invest into metabolic. Um, to expand metabolic resources. So the one, and then the thresholds for two neurons, one can approach it differently. If um, we fix the maximum, so in this problem, we decided to fix the average spike rate across the two neurons. And in that case, the, the average spike rate is related to the total number of spikes that um, the system can produce as a whole, thinking that you know, maybe that's limited by the blood supply and, and so on to the group of neurons. But one neuron can spike, produce more spikes than the other. So the difference between the thresholds of these two neurons is less weakly coupled to the metabolic cost than the average threshold. So that will be our key parameter to set what is the difference in thresholds for a given um, average threshold. So of the four parameters that are available, we will talk, um, there will be one free parameter to optimize. And this parameter is interesting because it will determine whether the two neurons are sometimes um, play equivalent role, meaning they have the same threshold and I average the result, or they play um, different roles. So then this is the figure that I ended um, last lecture. And now we will go over this figure one more time because I think it's important and then go inside the calculation and disassemble its parts to find out what is the driving force between the bifurcation that we see here. So what is shown in this uh, three-dimensional graph is the information that these two neurons convey about underlying Gaussian signal as a function of the threshold difference between neurons. The average threshold is fixed for all of these curves and then noise um, is the same for these two neurons. And then it uh, changes from large values in the red color to small values in blue color. So one can see that when the noise decreases, the overall information that these neurons convey increases. That uh, makes sense because once we have less noisy neurons, then we get more information. But what is interesting is that um, there is a bifurcation between having, uh, for a given value of noise, if noise is large, then the peak of the information is at zero, means I would like to have identical thresholds and average the result, 
or um, we can have um, slightly different thresholds. And uh, uh, so we can uh, look inside this uh, information function and see what causes this bifurcation. So at this point, we observe that the optimal threshold difference becomes non-zero. And the further you go from the critical point, the larger is the optimal uh, difference between thresholds. So the less noisy are the neurons, the further I can separate them. Um, the further is the optimal separation. And if we change parameters, so well, as I said, for a set of these curves, the average threshold is fixed. But if we um, move around, the change the average threshold, then this um, um, picture will remain, but slightly the position of the critical point will change. So I thought that it might be interesting now to um, take a look inside this computation and um, we will um, examine together what is the driving force for uh, this bifurcation. So I thought that we will um, have a little file in Mathematica and we can uh... Okay, so we can um, first, I would like to so um, the code is minimal, so I just define the logistic nonlinearity here. And Sorry, uh, uh, yes, maybe do you see the, the type is a, is a little bit too small. Uh, okay. Can you see the well, type? Well, so, uh, let's see. So the, there is a way, way, is this mathematical? Yes, I can do bigger. Um, font. I, I think there is a way to change the font, right? Yes, yes, I will, I will move things around. And um, so what I was hoping, um, let's see if uh, I do view or something now. Maybe in format. Format, okay. Size. Let's do larger. Oh, no. Uh... I think there is an advice for me in the chat. On the right bottom corner, you can change the font size. Right bottom corner. Let's see. Hmm. Um, Yes, usually you have a slider uh, and a uh, right, yes. Yes. Oops, oh. that, that's not what I meant, okay. <laughs> well, I guess that's one way of solving the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's see, but there should be, it says style, input, um, format, size, um, 16 points, like that. Is that better? Yeah. It'd be it's better. A bit better. No. It's a bit better, yes. Well, let's, we can make it better. Is that better? Should be okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, I mean, the, the code is n not that. Um, so I will remove parts that we don't need. So no, I will give you um, um, that actually we don't need noise entropy. So the phenomenon is entirely based on response entropy. So this is. And. Um, so we define logistic nonlinearity. You can define a different nonlinearity. It doesn't matter so much. And uh, this is, so now with, um, we have 
uh, two neurons. So we have four response patterns, one, one, zero, 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 one, and one, zero. So, and uh, the response entropy, um, so P11 means, um, so this is, is a function of uh, these four parameters, a uh, threshold for one neuron, noise for the first neuron, threshold for second neuron, and noise for the second neuron. So we have a Gaussian distribution of signals, and we have uh, logistic nonlinearity for the first neuron, and logistic nonlinearity for the second neuron, and we integrate. So this is uh, P11. So we need um, the probability that both neurons will spike. P00 is uh, the same thing, but uh, instead of logistic nonlinearity with respect to X, you get a logistic nonlinearity minus that. So, um, um, instead, so one minus, um, I do one minus this, turns out it's the same thing as logistic nonlinearity with minus X. And then P01 is um, you take zero, the opposite sign for first neuron and the positive sign for the second neuron and, and then um, switch around. So then our response entropy is uh, um, a sum over the possible P00 log P00, P11 log P11, P01 log P01 and so on. So we just have four terms. And mutual information we don't need for now because the, the main effect is already present in uh, um, uh, in response entropy. So now if, um, um, now we can disassemble and look. So if noise is large, so NN is noise in my case, so we will get, uh, it takes a little bit of time because these are uh, infinite um, integrals and um, um, it takes a little bit of time to compute, but you can see that with one, it will look like this. And when noise is small, it um, uh, the, the, the derivative will have the opposite sign. So the critical point will be somewhere between one and zero two. So um, we can, uh, what noise values would you like to try? That's a question for students. What value should we try? Huh? Maybe zero dot seven. Maybe? Point seven. Zero dot seven. Yeah. Zero point dot seven. seven. Point, point seven. Point seven is okay. I mean everything. But between this okay. regime, we know that our critical point is somewhere in between these two regimes, right? So um, point seven is too big. Let's do point five. You know how to find. Uh, the, the algorithm for finding a zero of a function. So we're looking for the zero um, uh, change in sign of this um, nonlinearity. And notice that 0.5, but now the scale, um, I guess it's getting a little bit um, smaller, the range. Mm -hmm. So we can do maybe plot range all if I can do that. Um, we did 0.5 and we know 0.2 is too big, so we will do something in between. Um, you know, this method of uh, finding is zero, you take the interval and you divide it by half, so between 0.2 and 0.5, 0.7, around 0.3 uh, will be our next value. <clears throat> So it might be also, um, so 0.3 is on, already on the other side. And uh, so what is, 
um, maybe would be interesting is to sh to see how these uh, various um, um, terms behave. So we can discuss how. Um, so initially, when, for example, it can be a, a homework exercise, if um, the threshold is the same, and as you notice, I'm plotting the threshold difference. So one, one can expand this, um, um, this expression. So for example, P01 and P10 will be the same term approximately. And then um, how these, uh, these four probabilities, um, how they change to um, change this behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, um, the, the symmetry breaking, so the noise is only plays into account by, um, but only by affecting the probabilities of response. So the, the noise entropy doesn't, um, um, doesn't affect, um, it doesn't, it, it's not the, the driving, uh, um, uh, driving force. Mm -hmm. So I even think that if we expand, we find something that is, um, a product P00, P11 over P01, P10, this, um, this ratio as a, um, as a critical variable. So um, that any questions so far? Say it again. Uh, just a moment. Uh, we need the mic. Sorry. Could you just tell one more time why, uh, what were the four states? Okay. So let's um, four states. The four probabilities. The four states. Yes. Okay. So the this one is um, the four state is. P zero zero. Um, we can uh, plot them. Um, maybe that's so. This is the probability that no um, no spike has occurred. Okay, so um, this is zero, zero, okay. And then when both neurons are spiking, then the next one is... Um, so, uh -huh. And then when one of them is spiking and the other one is not. Okay. And um, the other one, we can maybe even plot them together to save screen. So maybe I can try to write it on the blackboard. So essentially you have uh, the signal and then uh, the threshold, okay, and um, and then uh, um, so and this is uh, uh, this is the is the x that is going to go to this nonlinear function, which in this case is the logit, and uh, which is uh, say. 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus x is a function of x. And uh, so 
this is the probability of firing. Okay? Tanya, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, that's okay. right. This is the probability of firing, and X uh, is uh, this uh, signal that in this case uh, is a Gaussian with a certain mean, uh, which is mu. So this is the threshold tau, and this is the mean mu, and uh, it has a certain uh, variance, uh, which I think is B, right? Um, so the signal, um, so um, let's set the uh, signal, the, very, uh, the mean of the signal to zero, because everything, we will count everything ah, okay. relative okay. to the mean. Okay. And so the threshold tau is what I call mu. Okay, okay. And then um, the variance, um, we will, the variance of the signal will be one because everything will be counted in units of the okay. variance. Okay. So and then the noise uh, new um, is in units of uh, signal variance. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, let's call this a phi of x. So essentially what, uh, so, the probability that a neuron fires is uh, phi of uh, x. This is uh, x of t, right? Yes. x uh, of t minus mu. And then uh, it's divided by b, no? Which is the noise. Uh... Of the neuron. Yes. yes. Okay, so um, so this this b is essentially related to the slope of this line, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is the uh, probability that uh, uh, neuron uh, one fires. Yes. And uh, and this is the probability that uh, so this is b one. No? that neuron two fires. Okay, so this is uh, P11. It depends on uh, mu1 and B1, mu2 and B2. Okay? Is this clear? Then, then you have uh, four possibilities. So, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Uh, and so you compute the entropy. Yes, I think it might be useful to write it down, um, the probability of no spike as 1 minus this, and then to yeah. show that <coughs> it is um, so one the opposite sign. Uh, phi of x uh, is equal to, say, uh, Say so one minus one over one plus e to the minus x. So this is equal to if you do the calculation, this is e to the minus x. Well, one plus e to the minus x. You multiply by e to the x, and so this is one divided by e to the x plus one, which is phi of minus x. Okay. Yes, thank you. So this is the probability of not firing, right? And it's yes. v to the minus x. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so now if we look at this, we can plot these probabilities as a function of the threshold difference. So we set uh, the average uh, threshold to, say, 1. In, in units of the standard deviation of the noise. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the noise, I think, is set to one also. Um, let's see. Oh, I guess noise, so this is the value of the noise, 0.35. And um, the probability of not firing and the probability when 
kind of symmetric probabilities, they are smoothly behaving. So they're, you know, if we plot them separately, they will be <coughs> you know, little peaks like this. <coughs> but when pl uh, plotted jointly, they're, um, you know, they're, they're essentially constant. And then uh, P, the cross terms, when one neuron is firing and the other is not, are more affected by the threshold difference. Okay, so in, in that case, there is some, something interesting to look at. And now we can um, change from this probability <laughs> to log uh, P times log P. So in this case, uh, um, I, you know, let, let's see how this one will behave. <laughs> so we do log of this quantity. And multiply by itself. <clears throat> and then we have P11 minus I think it's okay. Okay, so they're they're already looking um, um, looking more interesting, and you see that the balance between them can um, um, they already have different signs because they are on the opposite side of. Um, um, <clears throat> Um, of large values. So in general, I think it's also useful to know this property. Um, how does the log of um, P log P depends as a function of um, P. So if we say uh, X um, I don't want to do it. Okay, so this is a useful uh, function to know. So this is the entropy of a binary process that goes between zero and one. And uh, um, because it's a kind of natural log, it doesn't go to one, but it goes between zero and one. So in our case, P00 was, um, and P11 were on the opposite side of this function, so um, they have the opposite um, second derivative. And then we can take a look at the cross terms. Okay, so these ones um, behave um, as they are. And so um, if we take noise to be very large, um, so now maybe the sum of these two terms Okay, so the sum of the cross terms um, between the neurons that are firing, uh, one of them firing and not the other, will 
make it will drive the system towards the same threshold and then the um, these terms here the one that um, 0 0 and 1 0 Um, can drive um, the system towards different threshold. So this uh, analysis here says that the driving force behind this transition is um, this um, transition between uh, uh, kind of the interplay between not uh, when neither neurons are firing and the neurons and both neurons are firing and whichever term uh, wins is um, um, uh, it determines the transition. So in other words, if we plot these uh, two terms separately here, so the term that is most important is, um, um, is this term P00. We need that um, that term to be um, large in order to have a positive derivative at mm -hmm. the um, at the kind of and the the way we so this is the effect at um, the um, tails of the uh, distribution um, with zero, zero. So if we uh, go above the critical point, so we know that um, already I think point seven was above the critical point. <clears throat> and, um, and so then these two terms are, um, there's, well, maybe get closer to the, Okay, so um, the, the conclusion is that the, the interplay between these terms 0, 0 and 1, 1 is the one that, um, um, so this term has to, the key term is the absence of spikes in both neurons. So information from silence is the one that will be driving the transition towards diversification. Any questions so far? Okay, so then maybe we can go, um, I'll go back to the main PowerPoint and I can upload this uh, mathematical file uh, to Slack and then you can um, examine in more detail what's going on in the, in the calculation. Okay, so this is um, um, the excitement that comes from diversification. And uh, a, a few more, um, uh, questions for the audience. So what do you think will happen when instead of a Gaussian distribution, we change to a sparser distribution? Um, or um, change the, the mean, um, the average threshold between neurons? Uh, any insight? So I have a general question. So um, um, essentially, uh, in this exercise, what you are doing uh, is you are taking the uh, the response function of the neurons fixed, right? So the yes. The, the, okay. So. Uh, seems to me that the specialization occurs because the uh, the noise, uh, the variation of the noise, 
is too sm it becomes smaller than the dynamic range of the neurons and then uh, it is convenient to have uh, neurons with two different thresholds uh, to essentially reproduce a larger dynamic range of the two neurons as a whole. I don't know if, if that yes. makes sense. Um, yes, so the, the, uh, the nonlinearities are fixed, but they, they are, the parameters vary um, along this axis and along that axis. So when the neurons have smaller noise, then you, you can kind of tile the underlying analog signal and assign them different, uh, different parts of the dynamic range to these um, two neurons. Yes, exactly, so, yes. Okay, and then remember last lecture we talked about how the neuronal nonlinearity has to be the um, has to be the cumulative distribution of um, the input distribution. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, what at the end of today's lecture? So, what we will discuss if you have more neurons than two, then you will continue this um, pathway, uh, this uh, splitting of the thresholds. And ultimately, I mean, maybe I will show this figure now, you will end up with a distribution of threshold that matches the probability. Um, well, I will take this slide maybe now and show. So what happens if you have more than two neurons? So this is this slide here. <clears throat> if you have, um, they have a different problem. Um, uh, they, um, but um, um, the same kind of uh, result holds. They have a different definition of noise. But um, this is the threshold. And... Uh, um, as they um, kind of number of, in their case, they are adding the number of neurons. But you can think of this as transition between uh, high noise and small noise for a given, uh, for a large, in a population with, say, 1,000 neurons. So what happens is they all start with the same threshold. And then they split into two subgroups, maybe not equally, but... Um, um, let's say equally, but in reality could be in different proportions. So 500 neurons take this threshold and 500 neurons that take this threshold. And then you can take this part of the dynamic range mm -hmm. and consider it separately. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So when the, because the variance is small, the input variance uh, is smaller, so the effective noise is larger, so you will have to go a little bit further <coughs> until you reach the critical point for that part of the dynamic range, and then they will split. And so the splitting will continue, and then ultimately, um, if we are allowed to make the noise in the individual neurons very small, then um, um, then each of these thresholds will be a separate neuron. Mm -hmm. And the distribution of these thresholds will be the input probability distribution. And when we sum the activity of this neuron, uh, of this population, it will be the cumulative distribution of uh, input signals. And so we are arriving back at the Laughlin's result in the weak noise limit um, through this idea that what La Laughlin result represented was one neuron, but it was a summed activity. You can think of it as a summed activity 
of many little neurons that are packed inside mm -hmm. with individual channels. So it... So I just wanted to understand whether this is clear, whether they are... Okay. Yeah, so there is a lot of um, in information here because we um, are, and then we can go back and forth. So this was kind of one of the concluding slides, but I I'm showing you where we are going. And then uh, maybe we will uh, um, uh, trace the path. So the idea is that you start with one neuron and what people say is that the the neuron is a um, has a spike rate, and it represents the summed activity of various compartments. And these compartments can they have different thresholds? So um, it's a way of maybe not fully developed. This theory not fully developed is to coarse grain a neuronal population and represent it as one effective neuron that now has multiple response rates. But in this way, we can unite this picture with thousand neurons and each neuron is binary. And then um, what should their thresholds be? And arrive back at the result from last lecture on, um, if I can draw, maybe um, I cannot quite um, annotate here. So if, if Matteo, can you reproduce this result where um, neuronal nonlinearity will be like a sigmoidal function or here, and it is a cumulative distribution of the input um, thresholds. Yeah, so, so. So if you have, uh, say this, uh, this is the distribution of uh, inputs, right? Then, uh, and uh, so this will be like, uh, the, this will be P of X. This will be the integral minus infinity to X of P of X, X prime, okay? And uh, the optimal uh, um, response function uh, uh, should, should exactly be equal to this, right? Yes. Okay. And now I can think of um, if I put this threshold density similar according to uh, the input distribution, such that more thresholds in the middle and fewer thresholds on the edges, mm -hmm. then um, the yeah, so joint that's... activity of these neurons so will be the activity of that low noise neuron. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now, instead of, you know, if, if all neurons have some fixed amount of noise, but their thresholds are distributed according to... Yeah. Mm. So essentially, the low noise limit is where uh, the, the, the response function uh, is still uh, like... Uh, is still like this, uh, okay? But the noise now is, uh, is, much, is much more uh, peaked, okay? And this is the threshold mu, okay? Mm -hmm. So that essentially you want to place uh, different neurons uh, with different thresholds uh, at different, uh, say, mu1, mu2, <laughs> mu3, etc., etc., in such a way that the density of thresholds uh, uh, in any interval, matches the dense, matches the, say, the derivative of of this response function. Okay. Is this clear? Yeah.
So <coughs> we said so the optimal uh, transfer function, okay, so the optimal g of x should be equal to uh, the cumulative distribution, okay, times a constant, okay. So essentially, uh, now we are in a situation where the the noise. Uh, um, uh, um, so the transfer function is fixed, okay, and, and and this is not satisfied because essentially the noise is very low variance. It has a very uh, low, uh, uh, say, um, low noise limit, okay. So the distribution of the signal is very picked, but you have many neurons, okay. So what you want to do is to have uh, uh, the, so to, you want still to have the, the population of neurons as a whole response, response in a way to mimic this, this relation here, okay? So what you want is that, uh, say, the, the number of neurons which have uh, uh, a threshold uh, in this interval should be proportional to the derivative. So if you take the derivative of g, g prime of x, this should be essentially a constant times uh, the probability of having stimulus x, okay? So you want that the fraction of neurons which have a threshold in an interval should be proportional to the derivative of the response function. Is it okay, Tanya? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. So we, um, yeah, yeah, so it, it's also, you know, if, if uh, you know, if, if uh, we go back to the case of two neurons, if uh, the nonlinearity is very stretched, I can't really cut this distribution in two. So it's only when the distribution is um, more, um, the response function is sufficiently sharp, then it makes sense to cut the input distribution in two. So that's another mm -hmm. um, um, kind of intuition behind the result. Yeah. Okay. So now I can uh, maybe compare this with data. So we will talk about um, um, neuroscience. So there was a question in the chat about um, uh, looks like supercritical beach work bifurcation. So this is more ideas from um, uh, dynamics. So what we will be discussing that it is um, um, more... Um, I mean, it, it is similar, but um, the the connection that I'm making is more closely with um, second order phase transition, not um, not in terms of dynamics. So that's we will um, analyze parameters of this uh, uh, bifurcation uh, in a few moments. So now in the retinal case, so <clears throat> a few background on the retina. So this is a famous recording from uh, the retinal cells done by Kuffler in 1953. And he shines light at different positions, A, B, C, or D, and records with a spike, um, uh, with an electrode, the number of spikes. So one can see that in the central position, neuron produces lots of spikes, and in the surrounding region, fewer spikes. So that led to the concept known as the receptive field for a neuron. So in that case, the receptive field will be somewhere bigger than um, region B, but um, A and D and C will be already the edges of the response field for that neuron. So this is one neuron. And now um, there are many neurons in the retina because it's a detector array. And there are different kinds of cells. Uh, but um, within each cell type, they tend to tile 
um, this space. And um, potentially, if, if there is interest, I can um, separate lectures, we can talk about variability in this array and how uh, coordination in the shapes of these arrays, why they're not perfect circles and so on. But for the purposes of um, today's presentation, you can ignore the fact that they are not um, um, pure, um, you can think of them as approximately circular regions. And the retina has been a very good um, uh, testing ground for theory because um, it's fairly close to the sensory um, uh, to the sensory inputs. And we can test these ideas about information maximization. And there are also different cell types. So we can think about um, coordination across different channels and why these cell types the way they are. So the canonical theory, um, a lot of um, the cell types were defined in this way, whether they are responding to lights on. So in this case, this is on paracel cells in the primate or off cells, which responds to light decrements. And um, whether these are more of a smaller cells, they're called midgets that are, have higher accuracy, spatial accuracy, and often color, red and green cells, and this would be blue and yellow cells. So that's one type of um, um, cell type specialization. But in addition, today we are talking about the cells that they were discovered in the retina that are more that whose experimental observation by uh, uh, Kastner and Bacchus have led to this theory of um, cell type specialization. So you have the stimulus, and these cells filter it with a very similar temporal kernel, uh, but then once you filter it, you get different kind of uh, stimulus. After that, you plot that on the x-axis. And in agreement with um, our theoretical framework, they turn out to have um, different thresholds. So here's an example of cells that um, the blue and red neurons that encode the same aspect of the light intensity in the visual world, but do this with different thresholds. And that was uh, surprising at the time because usually the cell types in the retina were defined by differences in how they um, filter the incoming signal. And in the retina, you can tell that there are actually two different cell types because they form overlapping mosaic here. So the idea is that the... The analysis that we did, the theoretical analysis, should be applicable everywhere in the brain. But in the brain, when we are far from the retina, when we do not have arrays of cells, it's harder to detect that um, cells form separate classes than in the retina. So um, Another observation is that in addition to these um, two cell types of cells, so they're both were responding to light decrements. So if on the previous slide, you can see they're called off cells because they primary integrate whether the light intensity went down. So when the light intensity goes down, this is when we get a large projection onto the X axis. So that's why they're called off cells. And then there is an on cell would be the one that has a kernel that goes up and then comes down. So in the case of the on cell, here is an example of nonlinearity. And you notice that it is less steep than uh, both of the off uh, um, cell types. And so that's a hint that these on cells in our language of the theoretical model, they will have larger noise. Mm -hmm. So by fitting these nonlinearities, we can estimate the average amount of noise for the two um, off uh, cell types 
and for the on cell type. So this one is um, around 0.3, and the other one is around um, for the on cells 0.45. And if you recall, in our simulation, our critical point was around uh, 0.3 something. So that's um, where um, the critical value would lie. So then uh, the critical value depends. So each neuron, when each pair of neurons, when they're recorded, they have slightly different, <laughs> for each pair, they will have a different average threshold. So when the average threshold is different, the p position of the critical point will be different. So this range here is the range um, how much this critical point changes when we change the average um, spike, the average threshold for the two neurons. So in other words, when um, the, in the experiment, they measure the filters, they measure the nonlinearity, and then we fit them, and we get these, our four parameters, mu1, mu2, nu1, and nu2. And after that, we can say whether the theory predicts the optimal mu1 minus mu2 consistent with the measurement of the three other parameters. Okay, so any questions about this? So this comparison uh, has essentially no uh, free parameters and it, um, um, ask um, why, or it, you know, attempts to explain why we have two off-cell types in the um, off-channel and only one cell type in the on-channel. And the explanation is that for on neurons, the noise is larger, and therefore these cells are in this regime, and in the off um, channel for light decrements, the noise is less, and so they are in this regime where it's optimal to have slight uh, different um, thresholds. Is it clear? Any question? Yes, Carlos. It's just curious. Sorry, curious. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, for, for. Uh, yeah. Uh, for curiosity, uh, the threshold level for neurons, um, experimentally, have you ch uh, found if they are time-dependent or signal-dependent or a, a certain neuron has a certain threshold his whole life? No, they are all uh, dependent and they all adapt. So, in fact, this data... Um, so, remember we said in the uh, kind of... Um, uh, in the theory, we said that um, I'm measuring all these units here in units of the standard deviation of the input signal. So, as the contrast changes, they, the nonlinearities shift. So there will be a moment or some period of time when if you change the input signal, the nonlinearity will not be optimal. And then it will converge to the optimal value as the neuron progress um, adapts. So I actually have um, additional figures to this, um, um, to this extent. So here, this slide here. Um, so, in this case, you have uh, um, different contrast in the um, in the input signal, and uh, so the thresholds are slightly, you know, differ as a function of the contrast, and noise doesn't scale perfectly with um, contrast, but the thresholds. Um, remain separate across the range of contrasts 
And um, yes, so that's uh, the answer. So the nonlinearities change, and to this um, uh, in this model, we assume that they have adapted fully to the uh, input probability distribution. But in reality, they will uh, be only partly adapted. And also, another thing is. Um, Um, another um, unre not I would say n not fully understood um, phenomenon or the one that I would like to understand better is that these um, neurons in addition to having different thresholds they also have different dynamics upon changes in the contrast so one neuron the high threshold neuron if you so they're also named adapting and sensitizing based on difference in dynamics um, of how they behave when the input probability distribution changes. So one neuron, I think, approaches the, 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 its final threshold value from the top, from large values down, and the other neuron jumps to the very low values and then increases. So they approach the optimal values from different um, sides. And uh, that um, theory is partly developed, I think, in the um, Bacchus and Kastner's papers. But um, I think more can be um, from the, uh, done from the theoretical side there. Okay. Is it OK, Carlos? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was asking mostly uh, also um, to see if there was a separation of time between the shift on the, sorry, sorry, the nonlinearities shift and the shift of the threshold, like maybe one of them is slower, so in order to correct it, the, the brain uh, uses this other strategy and vice versa. It's like... Yes, so I, um, I, I will prepare some slides for next lecture. So we had a um, uh, recent paper where we followed up on this um, result. And uh, r roughly speaking is that turns out that the difference between these two thresholds is... Um, what you can think of kind of as a theoretical approximation, that these two neurons are actually the same, but one neuron gets an extra inhibitory input from another cell. And in the case of the retina, it's an emocrine cell. So what happens is, so they, 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 it's possible that these two neurons are have identical properties, but one gets extra inhibitory input. And as a result, uh, its threshold gets higher. And then the whole circuit adapts to the extent to which that intermediate neuron adapts. So this intermediate neuron then coordinates the difference between the thresholds. <laughs> And, and then there are other interesting ideas. So it turns out um, that uh, there is a connection with a, a form of stochastic um, resonance. So th that, um, but in this system with um, kind of two neurons and then a third one neuron is coming in. So you, you might think that um, um, I'm deviating a little bit, but basically it turns out that it's every time I make a connection in, in neural circuits, I affect, I introduce noise. So, you know, the best way of having zero noise is not to have a connection. So it turns out it is, you know, in this case, I could have um, said, um, send one signal to one neuron and another signal to another neuron. 
but then I would have noise in both neurons. So it turns out that these neurons that have larger noise and they have larger threshold is because they get extra input. And that input, uh, the difference in the noise between these cells is because they get this extra inhibitory input. So the, the extra input can explain both the increase in the noise and increase in the threshold. Well, I, okay. um, yes, so, um, and now we, we are back to our, um, we can talk about um, various phase transitions. Um, so actually that was my second slide, but um, so across various contrasts, um, so these are, the thresholds are maintained and um, the difference um, between the cell types what we think in the retina can be disassembled is that one set of cell gets um, an extra input from another inhibitory neuron. So then here's an example of prediction. So we say this is uh, two neurons and we know their um, thresholds and we know their noise and uh, then you vary the threshold difference between the, uh, and you know the average threshold, but you vary the threshold difference and compare it with um, experimental points. So, and in very often the uh, theoretical um, peak of the curve corresponds with the actual measurement of the two neurons. <laughs> okay. So now, how can we think of this? Uh, um, this is a two analysis with two neurons. How can we make predictions for larger arrays? Okay. So now we, we can talk about uh, bifurcations. And uh, um, uh, and approximate this um, mutual information um, and, and I didn't tell you that uh, somehow I'm missing a slide, but basically the, the figure that I showed here was for the case where neurons have the same noise, but they also can have different noise levels. So in this case, um, yeah, so this is the slide I, I somehow skipped over. Um, so, as you, as, you note, as you noticed in the uh, experimental case, the neurons, both off neurons had smaller noise than the on neurons, but their noise in them was also different. So, if you make the plot of information versus average noise for two neurons and the threshold difference, but now neurons have slightly different noise levels, then you get the same picture as before, but now the surface is shifted. So it becomes optimal to put a neuron that has smaller noise closer to the uh, center of the probability distribution. All right, so we have a question in the chat. What are the assumptions behind this nonlinear information model? So the <clears throat> some assumptions, as we will discuss in a moment, matter um, matter in a quantitative way, but not qualitative. And some assumptions are, are maybe more critical. So the assumption was that the input distribution is Gaussian. So that's, that's not a critical assumption. You can change the probability distribution. We, um, the nonlinearity doesn't have to be a logistic function. It can be some approximately that. But in the, the critical assumptions are that neuron is binary. Each neuron is binary such that we have four states. And uh, another assumption 
is that the noise, their responses are independent given um, the input, although that's also not, um, will, will not affect the results. So Colin, did I, is, is that okay? I, I'm not sure whether and the chat is from a student who is online or in the class. Um, no, it's from a student online and we, we do not see the question because probably Colin I see. just applies to you. All right. So uh, Colin asked, what are the assumptions behind the nonlinear yeah. information model? Yeah, so the assumptions are that the neurons are binary and then we have four response patterns. And uh, so those are, this is the main assumption. <laughs> and um, so then um, this is, you know, this is the case um, when this is the picture that you get if you ignore the difference in the noise for these two neurons, <laughs> neuron types. And uh, if we take this small difference in the noise into account, then um, the picture shifts such that the two maxima are no longer equivalent. And um, one of the predictions here is that positive threshold, I think, um, have to go with uh, positive differences in the noise, just like in this um, experimental situation. So in other words, if uh, the neuron has smaller noise, then it should have smaller threshold. And so it will be encoding signals that are closer to the mean of the distribution. Um, so the symmetry is broken. So the, the first picture is a, what we can say is a spontaneous symmetry breaking. I have two identical neurons here in this picture. I have two identical neurons and quote unquote spontaneously one of them will go and take over a smaller um, uh, signals with smaller range, and the other one will take over signals with larger magnitude. But when the noise between them is not equal, then there is a bias, and the signals that are smaller should be encoded by a neuron with a smaller noise. And that's this picture right here, where um, the ex in the experimental case, the thresholds for the for the neuron that has higher threshold also has a higher noise value, and we now think that the difference between these both phenomena is that they get an extra inhibitory input. Okay, and then we talked about this. And now we can model this, um, the neighborhood of the critical point in the spirit of uh, mean field theory, of um, um, kind of Landau mean field theory. And um, so this is our information function. It will have a quadratic term, which is in terms of threshold differences, and it will have a a coefficient in front of the quadratic term that depends on the noise and it changes sign at the critical value. Then information cannot increase indefinitely. So we have a fourth order term and um, it has to be negative because the information will go down for large threshold differences. And then there is a linear term um, which is absent if the, there is no difference between neurons, but if you have difference in the noise between neurons, then it will have this linear term and break the symmetry. So you might notice that this is um, identical description to magnetization. We have, uh, I even chosen variables such that they will correspond. So the, what is magnetization is a threshold difference. Um, magnetic field plays the role of the noise difference between neurons. Noise plays the role of temperature. And then uh, we are maximizing information instead of minimizing free energy. 
So therefore, we, there is a mapping from this um, um, expansion to the theory of uh, phase transitions. And using this theory and um, um, predictions for large arrays, we can, we can use it to make predictions for large arrays. So do you have any questions about this expansion? So uh, I have a question about the sign of the first term. So when the noise is large, uh, uh, yes. You should have that the emission information is maximal for m equal to zero, right? Yes. So the coefficient should be negative of m squared. Yes, that's right. So, so, so I can get be out be of it with a, a with a being negative. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what's important is that it, um, it there, is, there will be a critical value. And it changes sign here, and A should be, um, yeah. yeah, can be negative. Then uh, once we have this expansion, I mean, this is one of the simplest thing that can happen to a maximum. So a maximum will change sign and becomes two maximum. So once you have this expansion, you have um, full predictions for how the threshold differences between neurons should behave as a function of the noise. So um, we know that it's just like magnetization as a function of temperature. So when noise is less than the critical value, then we will have a positive threshold difference. And because it's a linear term multiplying kind of a quadratic thing, we know that the optimal threshold difference uh, will go as a square root. So now you can analyze these um, numerically, and it's, it's almost, uh, you know, it's now surprised that if numerics, if um, we take mutual information and find the position of the optimal uh, threshold difference as a function of noise, it has to behave as the absolute value to the one half power. Then another one, and this is a, a prediction in terms of, uh, in the simulation you can uh, um, take it very close to the critical point to find the, um, that the, expo to find the exponent. So then the next prediction is how does the threshold difference should depend on the um, a difference in the slopes of the neurons. And according to the Landau mean field theory, the scaling should be as to the power of one third. And that's what you get here. In addition, for example, this is a proper second order phase transition. So we can take a look at the second order derivative of information with respect to this um, equivalent of magnetic field or the slope difference. And at this critical point, the second derivative will diverge. So that will be an analog of susceptibility. And if you fit the um, simulation points, then indeed you will get the scaling exponent of minus one that is predicted for mean field theory. And you can even have another second order derivative. So how does the information changes as a function of the second derivative of the noise? And it jumps um, uh, discontinuously um, between various uh, um, con two constant levels with the discrete jumps. So just like the, in the um, mean field theory for magnetization. So uh, now we can compare this with data. And uh, maybe it also partly uh, is related to the Collins um, question about which, mo which um, parts are, uh, which assumptions of the models are critical. So now imagine that th this, this picture which I um, 
that we talked about on the previous slide, that was for a given um, average spike rate for the two neurons, uh, given average threshold for the two neurons. Now, if uh, that parameter changes, then this is, um, magne uh, threshold difference as a function of noise will always behave in this square root-like way. But the coefficient that multiplies how fast the square um, in front of the square root will depend on the average firing rate. So once you know this um, um, numerically, this um, constant and how um, it changes as a spike rate, you can rescale. And therefore, you can put the data from different neurons, even though they have different spike rates, into unified coordinates. And uh, so then um, this will be one um, example. So this is a normalized threshold difference between neurons as a function of the noise. And uh, this is the optimal prediction of the theory, of the mean field theory square root. And the actual data lies below this, but you can still fit it as a uh, square root or some other exponent. And then we can compare the data. So it turns out that um, the scaling in exponent in the retina with respect to nu is slightly different from the optimal prediction. So it's about 0.4 instead of 0.5. And the scaling exponent with respect to change in the noise difference, it should be 1 over 3, but it is more like 1 over 7, so it's larger. And then you can ask, um, how does this compare to various physical systems? So um, the mean field, which is... Um, 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 these, these exponents are known in physics. So um, for the mean field, the prediction is 0 0.5 instead of 0 0.4 that we observe here. And this um, function is delta, which should be 3 instead of 7. And we can compare to various other dimensional systems. For example, 2D Ising model will have these exponents. 3D Ising models will have um, closer values to what we observed in experimentally. And also that matches experiments in physical systems. So we know that in order to go from mean field to the physical systems, we have to take into account fluctuations in neural responses. So, but it's interesting that our retinal array and its scaling exponents actually deviate from the mean field predictions, but they deviate in the same directions as um, experimental physical system. So the, it gives us at least a hint that if we take into account fluctuations across the array, then we will be able to explain these exponents better. Okay. Any questions so far? Well, I think it's okay. Okay. So um, I think... Um, we, we are close to um, being out of time, but I will just end by saying that we observed that the scaling exponents match the 3D icing model. And we can talk about, um, you know, the retina is a 2D array, so, but this matches in terms of scaling exponents. So it turns out there are uh, papers and results which say that a 3D icing model with nearest neighbor interactions, which is this one, is equivalent to a 2D icing model with long range interactions. So one can turn this result around and say that um, because we observe a match in the exponents, then it makes a prediction for how the um, scaling of the fluctuations in the, across the array will change as a function of the distance along the retina to this power. So I think I will stop here. And um, with, um, I think we are out of time. But um, um, I will leave you with this uh, 
parallels between neuroscience and physical systems, where we have a theory of how information maximization drives uh, symmetry breaking and biodiversity. And instead of free energy, you can think about information maximization, temperature is equivalent to noise, magnetization is the difference between uh, cells and, um, and various exponents. So, okay, so that, that's my slide for today. Okay, thank you very much. So, any final question or comment? So, if not, uh, uh, I would uh, ask your patient once again, because unfortunately we had some problem with the group photo. So, we have to, I'm going to ask to all online participants to switch on their camera, please. We take another uh, photo, and uh, we are going to take another uh, photo. Uh, Please switch on your camera so that we can do this quickly. Thank you. Hello, can you switch on your camera? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Colin, are you there? Okay, of course, if you don't want to be in the picture, it's perfectly fine. But, um, uh, yes. Okay, so when you want, I think... Uh, We can take the picture. Okay. Can you switch on the camera? Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, other Okay, very good, our first um, Anyone else wants to switch on the camera? I think we are... Uh, okay. So, should we go ahead with the picture? Okay. Okay. Smile, cheers. Okay, just one moment. Just one moment. Are we done? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. See you tomorrow. Have a nice evening.